Hello, and my name is Captain Brian Hupp with the Richmond Ambulance Authority, and I am the Deputy Section Chief of Training for UCI 2015 here in Richmond, Virginia. Today we're going to be talking about start triage um, and mass casualty incident triage. There are several different types of um, triage systems that can be used. Um, here in Central Virginia, we use uh, typically the start or simple triage and rapid transport, and that's specifically what we use here in Richmond. It's used for the initial triage only of patients. Um, and then when patients arrive into a casualty collection point or a treatment area, they can be sort of re-triaged according to more conventional assessment methods and criteria. The only thing we're going to use to conduct this triage is um, triage tape versus, you know, uh, tags or any other specialty type materials. We're strictly going to use this triage survey tape, uh, down, dirty, quick, easily recognizable and then we can move along to triage and treat other patients. Um, and the reason we want to go so quick in this and do it so accurately and, and so timely is that uh, an accurate patient count is going to be the key to managing an MCI and figuring out what resources specifically we're going to need, um, how many hospitals we're going to need to utilize to transport patients to, uh, figure out a good count of you know um, what other resources we're going to need on scene um, and the quicker we can do it the faster we can kind of do some things for patients uh, as far as, you know, massive hemorrhage control or bleeding control and also identify critical patients and get them into treatment areas to receive more definitive care. So we're going to start by some decision making. We're going to decide where we want our green patients to go. Uh, I want you to look for a place that's easily roped off with scene tape or even the green triage tape that we're going to be using to triage the patients. Um, look for uh, an alcove of a building a small vehicle parking area or something of the like uh, where we can point patients to and it kind of has some natural barriers. We're going to loudly use a vehicle PA system or a bullhorn or, or yell loudly with your voice. If you are injured or ill or you require medical assistance, I want you to walk to this area and wait in this area. Uh, request that a police officer or a firefighter or a provider monitor that area to ensure that non-injured persons are not mixing in with those people and then we lose kind of track of how many people that we have um, as well as we don't have people wandering off who are injured or ill um, and that helps us keep again a good patient counter we're not looking for patients that we're now accountable for that we've declared this mass casualty incident um, and they they kind of wander off um, begin, begin triaging all the patients that didn't move and here's a good indication if the patient walks they're green if they don't walk they're a yellow or red Start triage uses the mnemonic RPM, standing for respirations, perfusion, and mental status. RPM allows you to, to rapidly determine if patients are red, immediate, yellow, delayed, or DOA um, expected, or also gray. If any one of the three RPM tests are outside the normal limits, tag the patient red and move along. Um, there's no need to finish the rest of the tests. As soon as you come to one that is askew in that RPM, uh, tag the patient red and move along. So to begin our assessment, we've made that declaration of if you are injured and need assistance and can walk, get up and come over here. And now the things that we're going to be doing, this is all to patients who are not able to walk. Uh, respirations, we're going to evaluate the effort. We're going to not just how quickly they're breathing or how slowly they're breathing, but do they look like they're in some kind of distress? Do they have gurgling uh, in their breath or something of the like that has you in any way, shape, or form concerned? If you don't, if you have that, tag the patient red, move along. Um, if you don't have that and they're breathing adequately uh, and below 30 times a minute, then move on to the next assessment question. Um, the only difference is going to be for a pediatric patient or some a child above or pardon me below eight years of age. Uh, that's going to be 15 to 40 breaths per minute is the acceptable uh, range. What if the person's not breathing? In an adult, uh, we're going to reposition the airway one time. We're going to head tilt, chin lift the patient by placing a hand on their forehead, a couple fingers under their chin, and tilt their head back and see if they're breathing. If they're still not breathing after that one head tilt, chin lift. Um, tag the patient as expected to not ex ex to survive the incident. A gray tag. Um, don't don't start CPR. Um, this is this goes against a lot of what we what we do as pre-hospital care providers or as public safety persons or lay persons that expect us to dedicate a lot of resources to somebody who's that sick. But in reality, I want you to think about a uh, ten patients and we get to that first patient. 
and we do a head tilt chin lift and they're still not breathing so we do some rescue breathing we do some cpr and we maybe place an advanced airway and give them oxygen what if the next nine patients all required simple airway adjustment we didn't do that for those nine patients and we've now cost the lives of nine victims in an effort to save one and that's kind of all about what mci management is is using resources appropriately to care for all of the patients that you have and you know sometimes you might be in that position where you have a patient where you could do a lot for them um, but it's just not appropriate for every patient that you have at that location the only exception is going to be a child who's below eight years of age um, a child who's below eight years of age the most common cause of death in a child um, is usually going to be an airway issue, a breathing issue. So we're going to attempt 30 seconds of rescue breathing on the child. And whether we use a bag valve mask, a pocket mask, or mouth to mouth, we're going to provide uh, 30 seconds of breathing for that patient. Um, it doesn't matter whether the child has a pulse, because respirations and the RPM mnemonic are the first thing we've come to. Um, if the patient is not breathing in an adult, we're going to reposition the airway, still not breathing, gray tag, breathing, red tag. Child, below eight years of age, not breathing. We're gonna perform 30 seconds of rescue breathing. Not breathing still, gray tag and move along. Starts breathing after that, simple airway positioning uh, and red tag the patient and move along. So um, don't feel obligated to stay with a patient who you've opened up their airway. We can't, again, we can't dedicate specific resources to do just that. Um, we, we can hopefully keep their head back with one good positioning. If not, um, you, you can't stay with the patient. We can ask a bystander uh, or a lay rescuer, like a firefighter or a police officer to hold the patient's airway open, as long as we're not taking them away from other life safety type tasks. Um, or we can roll them into the recovery position. And then again, tag the patient and move along. So placing a patient in the recovery position is fairly simple. And as you can see, we're going to place the arm closest to us at a right angle and the one farthest from us across their chest. We're going to slowly and cautiously roll them uh, on to the side that we had at the right angle until their head is tilted over that arm, allowing fluid to drain out of their mouth and keeping their airway open. Now, um, this kind of goes against everything that we've been taught. You know, moving a patient who's been injured, uh, a patient who's unconscious should be immobilized or have some sort of cervical spinal precautions. But again, we don't have the ability or time or resources during start triage, during that start triage phase of an MCI, to dedicate manpower to that. Instead, we need to, again, uh, do this as quickly as possible so we can move on to all of the other patients and determine who's sicker than this person. And if none of them are sicker, then we're going to go back to this person and they're going to be the first one to go to the hospital. But if we find patients that are sicker, we do them a disservice if we, again, dedicate so much time to this person. Pulse or perfusion uh, is what we're going to be doing in our second one. So we've done our uh, walking wounded go to this location, we've done our respirations assessment, and now we're in the perfusion. On somebody above eight years of age, we're going to check their pulse uh, radially at their wrist. Uh, the reason we do this is it gives us an idea of their blood pressure. Um, if they are adequately perfusing blood, you should be able to feel a pulse at the wrist. If they're not, you shouldn't. Um, I don't care if there's no pulse at the wrist, because remember I've already assessed their breathing, and somebody who's breathing adequately which again, if the person was not breathing adequately, we would have red tagged them and moved along. Um, so the person must have been breathing adequately for us to move down to the perfusion check. Uh, if they have a pulse at their, if they do not have a pulse at their wrist, um, their blood pressure just may be very low. Uh, we're not going to move on and check a pulse at their neck. I'm not concerned about the pulse at their neck. I'm going to red tag the patient and move along. Um, Instead of attempting to find a pulse on children, which is kind of tough because you have to do that in a different location in the arm, uh, we're going to use capillary refill. Uh, which is kind of pushing down on the nail bed and then watching how long it takes for it to change color. Uh, and I'll show you a slide on that here in just a second, but that, that's not very reliable in adults, uh, adults rather. It's, it's equally as unreliable in kids, but a lot more easier to do um, than a full pulse check if you're not really proficient with checking a child's pulse brachially, um, just that good capillary refill. So checking for a pulse, we're just going to use two fingers, the middle and the index finger, along the thumb side here at uh, the artery on the inside of the wrist. 
And capillary refill, again, only on somebody eight years of age or lower. We're going to press on the nail bed and watch it turn white and then lift it up. And we watch it, want to watch it turn pink in uh, under two seconds. Anything longer than two seconds, we're going to determine that patient to be perfusing poorly. And we're going to red tag them and move along. So again, just to recap, we've done our walking wounded statement, our respirations, and now we've done our perfusion. Mental status. Uh, for adults, it's pretty simple. We're going to ask them to perform a simple task. Personally, I like to ask the person their name. Hey, say, me, say your name for me. And I can do this while I'm assessing their breathing with my eyes and assessing their pulse with my hand and kind of do all at once. Um, if they're unable to follow simple commands, tag the patient red and move along. Um, if the patient's able to follow simple commands, they have now successfully uh, completed their a good assessment findings for um, R, P, and M. Uh, the patient wasn't able to walk, so they're not agreeing, so they fall into that yellow, yellow category. A uh, child might be too young to follow commands, um, so I want you, you as the provider to kind of uh, assess. Are they acting appropriately for their age? Are they doing what a two, three, or four-year-old should be doing? Um, and that, that could be crying inconsolably. You know, the situation that you as a provider are over top of this person assessing them probably was not a good one. So there's a good chance that they could be pretty upset, and that's okay. And if they're acting upset, and they're acting scared, and they're crying, and you know, um, that's a perfectly acceptable assessment finding. Um, another thing you can do is, how do they react to their parent? If they're scared of you, but not scared of their parent, um, then that's, that's a good thing. Sometimes I'll ask mom and dad to tickle the child. Um, if the child's ticklish and they giggle when they've been tickled, that tells me that they're acting appropriately and doing exactly what they should be doing. Um, if the child's not acting appropriately, red tag that patient, move along to your next victim. Um, if the child is acting appropriately, again, we've done our walking wounded statement, our um, respirations, perfusion, and now mental status, yellow tag the patient and move along. So just a good algorithm here for start triage. We come across the patients, we make that statement. Anyone who walks is automatically a green. They go to the casualty collection point where they'll again receive more traditional assessment. Um, the patients who didn't walk, we're gonna assess their respirations. Are they breathing? Uh, if they're not breathing, again, we're gonna reposition their airway one time. If it's a child below eight years old, we're gonna do 30 seconds of rescue breathing. If they begin breathing on their own, red tag the patient and move along. Um, if they remain not breathing, the patient's a gray tag. We don't expect them to survive the situation. Um, if the patient is breathing, you know, below 30 times a minute and what appears to be, you know, adequately for you, move down to uh, perfusion. We're going to check a pulse there at the wrist for an adult, uh, capillary refill for a child below 8 years old. Is it present? If it's present, we move to the next test. If it's not present, red tag that patient and move along. Mental status, if all simple commands are acting appropriate to their age. Um, if they're doing that, yellow tag the patient. If they're not, red tag the patient and again, move along. So the only caveat to this rule are first responders, firefighters, police officers, EMTs, paramedics. Um, anytime that we come into contact in any sort of incident with uh, somebody that we work with pretty closely, like another, for my example, another paramedic, um, I need to get them off the scene. I, I need to treat them like they are critically injured and get them off the scene. Uh, why? why? Why is that important? Um, this person who is a provider who is injured or ill is somebody that I, for example, could have worked with for a long period of time. Um, I might have a very close attachment to this person and now my mind and the mind of all the other paramedics on this incident are not going to be on my job and they're not going to be on my safety and they're not gonna be on you know, looking out for um, secondary devices or looking out for slips, trips, and falls or providing good assessments or good patient care to the other sick and injured. So the best thing I can do is get this person off of the scene as quickly as possible. Now, uh, we're, the, you know, we try to consider use, considering them a red patient, um, meaning we have to get them off the scene quickly. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to be in an ambulance all by themselves as we would normally do with a red patient. You can happily, you know, if it's a green patient that just happens to be a police officer, load them into an ambulance with three other green patients and transport them to the hospital. Um, but again, it needs to be a priority to get them off of the scene because they're going to be a distraction for the other providers that are there. So pretty simple. It's simple triage and rapid transport. Um, it's going to be our initial triage that we're going to use in a mass casualty incident. Um, and. Uh, Again, patients that were able to walk that could be 
um, sicker than they appear. Uh, we'll get retriage in that casualty collection point based on more traditional assessment methods. And it goes by the basis of if you're able to walk, um, you obviously are perfusing enough oxygen to your body that uh, you're not in immediate threat of death. And let's take a second and find the patients that aren't able to do that um, and that might require, again, that immediate hemorrhage control or immediate airway positioning. So let's do some scenarios. Uh, scenario number one will be a bomb explodes in a large crowd of race spectators. This patient's a 50-year-old male whose chief complaint is chest pain. He's ambulatory, which means able to walk. He's breathing 32 times a minute. He has pulses at his wrist. He's able to follow commands. I hope that at the very beginning, as soon as I got to the word ambulatory or able to walk, you immediately thought to yourself, this patient's green. Uh, the rest of that information is completely pointless and invalid. The patient's able to walk, they're a green. Um, now, if you look there, they're breathing greater than 32 times a minute, which if the patient wasn't able to walk would make them a red patient, correct? So um, the patient will be re-evaluated in the casualty collection point. And if they have good work or breathing and they look to be in distress, then they'll be re-triaged. But again, it allows us to get those green patients out of the way and look for the folks that couldn't walk and figure out who's, who's sick and wasn't able to walk. A 50-year-old male, he's an on-duty paramedic. He has lacerations to his face and arms. He's able to walk. He's breathing 18 times a minute. He has a pulse at his wrist. He's alert and oriented. He's following commands. What is this? What category does this on-duty paramedic fall into? 100% correct. He's a red patient. Um, he's a responder. Um, it should be a priority to get him off the scene as, uh, he, so he's not a distraction to other responders. A 20-year-old male. He uh, has an amputation to his uh, left lower leg. He's bleeding profusely from the stump to that leg. He's not able to walk. He's breathing 16 times a minute. He still has a pulse at his wrist, um, and he's alert and oriented. Um, what category is this patient? And then what, what are some treatment considerations that we could consider for this patient? And this will be one of the few times that we actually perform an intervention. Again, we're only going to do um, basic airway maintenance as well as uh, bleeding control. So we'll put a tourniquet on this patient's leg, and if that stops the bleeding, and they still have a pulse at their wrist, and they still follow all the other RPMs, then that's going to be a yellow patient. Um, just because they have that serious of an injury, let's find the patients who are hemorrhaging elsewhere uh, that can't be controlled with the tourniquet. And those are the patients we need to get to the hospital pretty quick. 36-year-old female, uh, shortness of breath, able to walk, breathing 26 times a minute, has a pulse at the wrist, uh, is alert and able to follow commands. And the patient's going to be green. Uh, again, if, if they're proved to actually have some severe shortness of breath, they'll get reevaluated in that casualty collection point, and we determine if they should be upgraded to a yellow or a red. A 30-year-old female, um, she has shrapnel injury to her thigh. She's not able to walk. She's breathing 22 times a minute. She has no pulse at her wrist, um, and she's not following commands. Or she is following commands, rather. Excuse me. She is following commands. So red patient. Uh, the patient doesn't have a pulse at their wrist. Um, they obviously have a pulse somewhere because they're breathing, or else we wouldn't have gone down to perfusion. Um, so they don't have a pulse at the wrist. Their blood pressure must be pretty low. Let's red tag that patient, move along, and get them into the treatment area where they can receive some fluids and whatnot. A 33-year-old male, he's got a gunshot wound to the head. He's not able to walk. He is not breathing. He does have a pulse at the wrist, um, and he is not awake. Uh, you know, let's say this is one of those situations where you're able to do all your assessments at once. Um, you determine he does have a pulse, but he's not breathing and he's not responsive. Um, what category is this patient? What, what are some considerations here? And the patient's going to be gray. They're going to be expected to not survive the incident. Uh, we are going to open the airway. If the patient continues to not breathe, um, they're expected to not survive. Uh, resources should be dedicated to other victims. If the patient starts to breathe, tag them red. Um, you can maintain the airway by rolling with a recovery position and then move along to your next victim. A seven-year-old male, he's got a gunshot wound to the forearm. He's able to walk. He's breathing 24 times per minute. He has a pulse uh, at his wrist or good capillary refill, um, and he's able to follow commands and act in accordingly. Uh, the way we would expect a seven-year-old to act if they'd been shot. 
And the patient's green. Super tough to say because, you know, it's a kid. Uh, but the patient's green. They're able to walk. There's obviously enough oxygen circulating into his brain that he's able to make his feet move. So let's find patients that aren't. Um, and again, once that patient gets to the cash collection point, I imagine someone will will evaluate the situation. And if it's dire, upgrade them to a yellow or to a red. But for this initial off the cuff, you know, shoot from the hip, start triage, this patient's going to be a green. A 42-year-old male, he's shot in the shoulder. He's able to walk. He's breathing 42 times per minute. Uh, he has a pulse at the wrist, and he's able to follow commands. And the patient's green, because just strictly off the fact that they're able to walk. I know they're breathing 42 times a minute, and again, when they get to the um, casualty collection point of the treatment area, they'll be reassessed with more traditional and rational assessment findings. A 42-year-old male, he's kind of trampled by the crowd that was running from the shooting. He's not able to walk. He's breathing 42 times a minute. Um, his pulses are present and he's alert and oriented. If you look, this patient's um, exactly like the one we had uh, a couple slides ago um, with the gunshot wound to the shoulder, but the only difference here is that this patient's not able to walk. And maybe I gave it away to you, because that patient wasn't able to walk, the fact that they're breathing 42 times a minute now comes into play and is now a key factor that that patient is a red patient. Um, the fact that they weren't able to walk tells me that there's not enough oxygen getting to his brain to make his legs move or some other situations going on that uh, has the breathing 42 times a minute as a relevant factor to what his um, what his triage category is going to be. 34 year old female who jumped out of the window to escape the shooter and broke both of her legs. She is not able to walk. She is breathing 28 times per minute. Um, she has no pulse at her wrist um, and she is able to follow commands. And that's going to be a red patient. The fact that she doesn't have a pulse in her wrist tells me that um, her, her she's got something going on. Her blood pressure is probably fairly low, and, and she needs to be a priority for transport. A car driving through spectators into uh, a peloton of bike racers. A 31-year-old male, he fell off his bicycle. He's got abrasions to his legs and arms. He's able to walk. He's breathing 26 times per minute. He has a pulse at the wrist. Uh, he's alert and oriented. And this patient's green. Um, they're able to walk, uh, and in reality, this patient would hopefully walk to that the, the green treatment area or the casualty collection point, and we would never even assess their their um, RPMs because they meet that initial criteria of being able to walk. Now, um, this this guy might be fairly banged up, and again, in the casualty collection point of the treatment area, he'll re be reassessed with more conventional and rational assessments. Um, and maybe be recategorized re in his triage. A 28-year-old male, he's got a fracture to his left wrist and he's cut his scalp or head. Um, he's not able to walk. He's breathing 28 times a minute. He has a pulse present in his wrist and he's disoriented. So uh, as you saw, this patient's respirations and perfusion were just fine, but the fact that he's disoriented or not able to follow commands uh, makes him a red patient. 44-year-old on-duty police officer. He's got back pain. He's able to walk. His respirations are 16. His pulses are present. He's alert and oriented. So even though this officer's injuries are only back pain, we need to treat this patient like a red patient as far as the priority of getting them off the scene. Now again, I say don't dedicate a ton of resources. You know, put this police officer in an ambulance all by himself with just back pain. Um, we can put him in an ambulance with three other persons as we would any other green patient, uh, but the priority needs to be get him off the scene so that he's not a distraction for the other responders and the other police officers and the other um, firefighters and paramedics that are there um, who are now going to be worried about him, their friend, their coworker, rather than their own safety and their ability to perform their duties. 26-year-old male, been run over by a vehicle, hip and leg injuries. He's not able to walk. He's breathing 38 times per minute. His pulses are present. He's alert and oriented. In reality, patients like this should be fairly easy to uh, categorize. The patient wasn't able to walk. We got to them. We evaluated their breathing. They were breathing adequately, but 38 times a minute, bam. Red tag that patient and move along. We shouldn't have to do our perfusion. We shouldn't have to do our mental status. Uh, we can even count that up as we're walking to the patient and tear the tape before we even say word one to them. Um, and we can move along and start uh, finding patients that are sicker than he is. A two-year-old male that was run over by a vehicle, has chest and abdominal injuries. 
not ambulatory, not breathing, uh, does have a pulse or good capillary refill. Um, let's say we're able to feel the pulse in the uh, upper part of the arm. Um, the patient's not awake, not responsive, not following commands. And this is a tough one. Um, the patient's going to be gray. We're going to uh, assist ventilations for 30 seconds because the patient's under eight years of age. And if the patient's still not breathing after 30 seconds of rescue breaths, we are going to gray tag this patient and move along. And that's a pretty hard thing to ask, ask you as a provider to do. Um, now, if the patient starts to breathe after 30, 30 seconds of rescue breathing, then tag that patient red. And we can put them in the recovery position and we can move along, but we cannot dedicate resources. Again, I give that example of 10 patients and we dedicate all the resources to the first one and the next nine of them required simple airway maneuvering. We, we killed nine patients in an effort to save one.